Hello, this is Angelia. Uh, we are here on why you do what you do. Um, and this is a, a podcast about um, psychology and human development. Um, and uh, if you watch the watch or listen to the last one, uh, you heard about what my deal is, where it came from, and you know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, so we're going to just start right in on the study of human development. Um, and Heraclitus, uh, in the 6th century BC, said, There is nothing permanent except change. And that is true. Everything changes except change. And we're, we're going to look at, uh, focus on Victor, the wild boy of Aviron. I don't know if y'all heard about that or not. But um, there was this boy, he was out wild, and they found him. Um, and uh, he was not in good shape. He was, uh, yeah, having problems. Um, and some people uh, think that, you know, this is uh, part of the Tarzan myth, but this, you know, wasn't around that same time. So no one really knows for sure. On January 8, 1800, a naked boy appeared on the outskirts of the village of saint sernin in the province of Aveyron in south-central France. So you can imagine these people's surprise. This naked wild child appears at the edge of the village. Um, so they're freaking out, like, what is going on? You know, where is this kid coming from? What is going on here? You know, they probably thought maybe he'd been abducted and... You know, somebody done something to him or something. The boy, who was only four and a half feet tall but looked about 12 years old, had been spotted several times during the previous two and a half years. Climbing trees, running on all fours, drinking from streams, and foraging for acorns and roots. So clearly, this kid was wild. You know, he was running around drinking out of streams and waters and things and eating nuts. Um, so clearly, nobody had raised this child. Um, if you want to go back to the, you know, Mowgli, you know, thing, uh, maybe it could be something to, like that. Uh, but anyway, this kid was running around in the wild like an animal. When the dark-eyed boy came to St. Sernin, he neither spoke nor responded to speech. So clearly no one had taught him to talk. You know, if you grow up around humans and you can hear, um, then you start speaking. Um, if you can't hear, then people usually will start teaching you sign language. Um, so clearly the kid had not been raised around human beings where he had learned any speech. Like an animal accustomed to living in the wild, he spoke burned prepared foods and tore off the clothing people tried to put on him. So, you know, uh, whereas we might prefer a nice little piece of cake, you know, he'd much rather have a natural food like a strawberry apple. So, you know, that, that's was probably better for him anyway. He's probably pretty healthy. Um, and he definitely didn't want to wear clothes like most animals, you know, like people put the little shirts on the dogs and the dogs take their paws and pull it off or whatever. You know, he was not into clothes. It seemed clear that he had either lost his parents or had been abandoned by them, but how long ago this had occurred was impossible to tell. But clearly, it was a long time ago because he wasn't even capable of speech. The boy appeared during a time of intellectual and social ferment when a new scientific outlook was beginning to replace mystical speculation. Um, and, uh, you know, in the 1800s is when not only the industrial, but the scientific revolution was taking uh, place, a big part of it. Um, so they saw this as an opportunity to study this child, um, who clearly, um, did not come up amongst people. Philosophers debated questions about the nature of human beings. Questions that would become central to the study of child development. Um, because there were a lot of theories going on. You know, uh, we're going to get into theories later. But <laughs> there were a lot of different theories about how children developed. Um, so this, excuse me, I got an itchy here. This was an opportunity for them to study 
and, uh, you know, probably several guys wanted to prove their points, um, but to study, you know, why this kid was the way he was. Are the qualities, behavior, and ideas that define what it means to be human inborn or acquired or both? And uh, I can tell you because I read a lot of head on psychology. <laughs> they are both. You know, but some people believe you're born with all the qualities or that you learn. You know, nature versus nurture. Well, it's a little bit of both. You are born with a certain set of chromosomes. You're raised by people who give you certain beliefs and outlooks. Then you go out into the world with these things and sometimes other people influence you and you change or you're staunch and you don't change. Um, so it's a little of both. How important is social contact during the formative years? Um, and I can tell you it is important. Can its lack be overcome? Uh, well, we're going to get into that, but it's not so good of an outcome. A study of a child who had grown up in isolation might provide evidence of the relative impact of nature, your innate characteristics, and nurture, your upbringing, schooling, and other societal influences, like I said a while ago. After initial observation, the boy, who came to be called Victor, was sent to a school for deaf-mute in Paris. Um, so they captured this poor kid, um, and clearly he was a science experiment, uh, and they uh, put him in the deaf-mute school in Paris. There, he was turned over to Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard, an ambitious 26-year-old practitioner of the emerging science of psychiatry. So they at least put him in, you know, the good hands of the day uh, to figure out, you know, what could be done with this kid. Itard believed that Victor's development had been limited by isolation and that he simply needed to be taught the skills that children in society normally acquire. Um, because when you're born, you your parents start teaching you from day one. When they're looking at you going, hee hee hee, and mm -hmm, I'm teaching you how to do that. They're teaching you from day one. Um, so clearly this child got separated from his parents in some kind of way when he was very young. Um, and so he didn't learn anything from human beings. Excuse me. Um, and that is detrimental to your development. It really, really is. Itar took Victor into his home and, during the next five years, gradually tamed him. You know, I can only imagine what that entailed. Atar first awakened his pupil's ability to discriminate sensory experience through hot baths and dry rubs. So, you know, um, he was bathing the kid and, you know, rubbing the kid down, probably with Epsom salts or something like that. Um, back in the day, they probably thought that was, you know, something. He then moved on to painstaking, step-by-step -step training of emotional responses and instruction in moral and social behavior. And again, we can only imagine what that entailed back in 1800. Language and thought. Um, and again, they probably were using a reward and punishment system on him. Hopefully a reward, you know. But 1800, maybe, we don't know. The methods he tried used based on principles of imitation, conditioning, and behavioral modification, all of which we discuss later on, were far ahead of their time. And he invented many teaching devices used today. Um, so, imitation. That's how babies learn. When you were a baby, you imitated your parents and imitated other people. And that's how you learned things. That's why you kind of got to watch what you're putting into your kids. You know, like... Certain TV shows. There was a TV show I didn't let my kids watch, but it, other kids came over and like, oh, we want to watch this. So then my kids started uh, watching that, and then that didn't go so well because they started imitating people on this show and some of the behaviors I was not 
uh, okay with and those behaviors were not okay. So that caused problems. So that's how children learn through imitation. So if you don't want your child to do or say a thing, then you shouldn't be doing or saying a thing because <laughs> they're going to imitate you. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I'm having an allergy issue today. Um, conditioning, again, when you teach a child um, and like this system of uh, punishment and reward, you're conditioning that child. You're teaching them how to do a thing um, and how to behave. And behavioral modifications, again, the reward and punishment system. Um, and uh, I personally believed in the... Uh, Chores chart with reward and punishment behaviors chart um, with rewards and punishment. Um, and punishment usually involved taking away of a thing or time out or grounding. You know, um, I don't believe in physically uh, hurting your child. I think there are times when you might need to snatch them up when they're putting themselves in danger or they're endangering someone else. Um, but those are the only times. But the education of Victor was not an unqualified success. The boy did make remarkable progress. He learned the names of many objects and can read and write simple sentences. And this is because he started at such a late age. He was about 12, they think. Um, it's a lot easier. Your brain is very plastic when you're younger. But as the saying goes, can't he teach an old dog new tricks? And as some of us who are older, um, I started studying Spanish in my 40s. I still have a very small <laughs> Spanish um, speaking ability. Um, it is harder. It's harder for old dogs to learn new tricks. He could express desires, obey commands, and exchange ideas. Um, so he clearly learned some, you know, higher thinking he could express himself. Um, so, you know, that is something that is necessary uh, in human society. He showed affection, especially for Etard's housekeeper, Madame Guirin, as well as such emotions as pride, shame, remorse, and the desire to please. And these are things that all children do, you know. When they're young, they want to have their own way. It's toddlers, is it my way to heck with you? You know, they'll fight you if you let them. Uh, excuse me. But as they grow, they realize um, that that's basically getting them in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, when they get fussed at, um, they feel negative emotions, you know. Um, and if you do it properly... That's good because then they realize what they did was wrong. You know, it was the wrong thing to do. Um, and so then they can develop ways of uh, doing things right, but still, you know, negotiating with you uh, via, you know, a reward system. And there should be some negotiation. Um, you should let your child make their own decisions because then if you don't, when they get older, they're not going to be capable of making their own decisions. They're going to lean on you. You're going to raise a very codependent co person. So, mm, excuse me, that's not good. However, aside from um, uttering some vowel and consonant sounds, he never learned to speak. So, he was able to write. He was able to express himself. Um, but speech was hard. Speech was just not in his grasp. And that's because, like I said, your brain is much more plastic when you're young than when you get older. So it's much harder to learn, um, things like, uh, speaking, uh, when you're older. So, you know, that just shows you that, uh, there is a certain developmental schema, that you can't just hop in in the middle of it and have things come out the same way, which is what they wanted to try to prove or disprove. Furthermore, he 
He remained focused on his own wants and needs and never seemed to lose his yearning for the freedom of the open country and his indifference to most of the pleasures of social life. So, even though, you know, he learned basically to get along in this household and he probably didn't have much of a choice, um, he still would probably much rather go out and run around than fit into society and appreciate the societal niceties and the societal norm. When the study ended, Victor, no longer able to fend for himself, as he had done in the wild, went to live with Madame Guerin until his death in his early 40s in 1828. So, you know, we had the wild child um, who wasn't quite into, you know, human society. He realized, you know, I'm sure at some point that he was a person and these were other people. Um, and, you know, he kind of wanted to be there. But also, you know, not 100% on board with this social nicety stuff. Because the, the way he grew up, basically, was, you know, fitting for himself. The, the big thing was getting food and water and probably a safe place to sleep. Um, and all these societal rules, you know, were new and a problem for him. You know, because to him... It only made sense to think about him because that's what he had done all his life for 12 years. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are like that. Um, they do it for a lot longer than 12 years. Um, and that causes problems in their lives because here's here's a notice to some of you. It's not all about you. Unfortunately, it's, it's not all about you. It's about all of us. And if you make it all about you, um, other people are not going to be cool with that. Because other people want to have life too. Um, and if you're trying to have a relationship with another person and it's all about you, that's going to be a problem because the other person also wants some of it to be about them. It can't all be about you because then they don't have a life. It's, it's then they're, you know, contributing to your life. Um, and that's not okay because you both should have a life. So once again, it's not all about you. <laughs> Why did Victor fail to fulfill Itard's hopes for him? The boy may have been a victim of brain damage, autism, a brain disorder involving lack of social responsiveness, or severe early maltreatment. And um, they don't know because he couldn't explain it to them. Um, but all of these things can, you know, cause problems. Um, Autism is something, you know, I'm familiar with. Um, we have Asperger's in my family. Um, so there are situations where, you know, they can get overwhelmed. You know, they don't have proper emotional responses. Um, and they can have very severe emotional responses. Something we think is not that big a deal. But it can cause them a ton of anxiety. Um, so because this child was so young, he could not express what had happened to him, you know, why, you know, this situation came about. Um, so we'll never really know. Um, but clearly, um, there was delayed development. And it was due to the fact this kid was basically not by, brought up by anyone but himself. The Tard's instructional methods, advanced as they were, may have been inadequate. Um, and in the case, you know, of a 12-year-old trying to learn what a 5-year-old, it probably was. Because even though he hadn't learned these things, he still had the mind of a 12-year-old. Um, and so, again, at that age, if you can think back to when you were a preteen, you're probably a little bit resistant, a little bit, you know, into yourself. And um, it was a little bit probably hard, excuse me, for Victor to feel a need to do these things other than to please, you know, the people around him. Attired himself became to believe that the effects of long isolation could not be fully overcome. And that Victor may have been too old, especially for language learning. So this was the first cue to scientists that, well, there might be an optimal time for learning language. 
Um, and, you know, some of you uh, understand that if you work in a school, school system is why preschool is instituted or, you know, um, whatever program that your school system calls preschool, um, that there is an optimum time for language learning. Although Victor's story does not yield definitive answers to the questions the TARD set out to explore, it is important because it was one of the first systematic attempts to study human development. So this incident here was the first attempt to study human development. Um, and clearly they didn't have all the pieces um, because they were trying to figure out, you know, why this kid is the way he is. But because he was old, he could not express why he was the way he was. So, you know, they just had a little piece of the puzzle. Um, and later on, we would get more pieces and, you know, put them together and learn more about human development. But he was the first guy to start this. Although Victor's story does not yield definitive answers to the questions Atard set out to explore, it is important because it was one of the first systematic attempts to study human development. And systematic means he came up with a system of how he wanted to do this. You know, start out with this and this and this and this. Um, and that's basically, you know, what happens when you're in school. When you kid your, send your kid to school, I'm sure you remember school. Um, there was a systematic way of learning. You know, you and some of us, we, we would be like on levels or units, you know, and you would move up. Um, and so we've learned enough to know there's a way that makes sense to the brain um, where you have a base and then you build and build and build and build on that um, to get, you know, the optimal learning situation. Since Victor's time, we have learned much about how people develop, but developmental scientists are still investigating such fundamental questions as the relative importance of inheritance and experience. And inheritance is what you have inherited from your biological parents. Um, and then experience is everything you've ever experienced. Everything you experience adds experience to your life. And it influences you in some way. And how they work together. Um, so again, we went back to the nature-nurture thing. It's both. They work together. <coughs> Victor's story dramatizes the challenges and complexities of the scientific study of human development, the study on which you are about to embark. Because um, that, I felt, was the place to start with this, on how we develop. Um, we're getting into other specific stuff later on, if I keep doing this long enough. Um, but I feel like human development can explain why you do what you do. <laughs> In this introduction, we'll describe how the field of human development has itself developed. Because any science grows, any science learns. You know, poor old Marie Curie, we now know radiation will kill you, um, but it can also cure cancer. So, you know, science grows. <clears throat> we present the goals and basic concepts of the field today. We identify aspects of the development and show how they interrelate because everything does interrelate. We summarize major developments during each period of life because each period of life does have certain things that you should be. I mean, I'm sure when you go to the doctor, you know, they said, you know, well, have they reached these milestones yet? You know, when you go to the pediatrician, they want to know, are they walking yet? Are they talking yet? Because there are certain things that everyone has in common and they expect, like, when you're seven, your front teeth fall out. And sometimes when you're older. But, <laughs> you know. We look at influences on development and the context in which it occurs. And that's the important thing. And that was the problem with poor old Victor. Um, his development uh, was in the wild. So his context did not allow him to develop like a, like a normal human child. After you have studied, uh, you should be able to answer each of the following. Uh, look for them again in the margins. Okay, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you can tell I got my textbook out here. Okay, and uh, it just tells us that we're going to be looking at stuff. 
Um, so we're going to be looking uh, at the study of human development and how it evolved. Uh, from the moment of conception, human beings undergo processes of development. And yeah, we know that. Uh, a baby can't just hop up and walk and talk the minute it's born. It has to learn these things and we all develop. You know, uh, that's the key here is development. Um, because if you're like poor Victor deprived of certain aspects of your development, you're going to come up short. The field of human development is the scientific study of those processes. Um, and, you know, everything is a process. Everything in life is a process. Like I said, you just don't jump up from day one, doing everything and knowing everything. It's a process. Developmental scientists, professionals who study human development are interested in the ways in which people change throughout life. And you do change throughout life. Thankfully, you're not the same person you were when you were a baby. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be just wanting to eat and sleep and go to the bathroom and, you know, cry whenever your needs don't get met. Now, <laughs> that's not to say there aren't people like that. <laughs> but we'll get into that later, too. <laughs> as well as in characteristics that remain fairly stable. Because as human beings, we all have characteristics that remain fairly stable. You know, humanity has common things. You know, there are commonalities in all species. Um, and we have common things. The formal study of human development is a relatively new field of scientific inquiry since the early 19th century. And, uh, you know, uh, that's relative to other sciences. When Attard studied Victor, efforts to understand children's development have gradually expanded to include the whole lifespan. Because you do learn all of your life if you let yourself. There are some people decide, I'm 18, 30, whatever, I'm done, I'm not learning anything new, and so you don't, you know. Um, you can decide to be ignorant and stay where you are, that's your choice, you know. But for a lot of us, we want to learn more and more and more when we learn everything we can learn, um, become the best person that we can be. Early approaches were forerunners of the scientific study of development, were baby biographies. Journals kept to record the early development of a child. So this is the next thing they were like, okay, baby biographies. We all probably uh, had baby books and have baby books for our children. I know I do. Were you recorded? When's the first time they talked, sat up, walked, you know, all those milestones. You recorded what age they were um, because, you know, those are important. This is a big deal, you know, oh, he, you know, sat up today. He stood up today. That's a, that's a big deal on a, a person's development. You know, you go from laying there where you can't do anything to now you can sit up. Now you can stand up, you know. Um, and I just thought that was amazing, you know, with my kids when they could do these things. And they give you that look like, you know, ah, look what I did. You know, and you're like, oh my gosh, you did so good. I'm so proud of you. You know, and then they just eat that up. They smile and eat that up. Um, and that's, you know, how it should be. You know, you should be enjoying the children growing up, you know, and meeting these milestones. In 1787 in Germany, uh, they contained Dietrich Tiedemann's observations of his son's sensory, motor, language, and cognitive behavior during the first two and a half years. Um, because this is when the physical changes happen the most is the first two and a half years because you learn to sit you learn to stand you learn to grab things um you learn start learning to talk you learn to feed yourself um so these are the biggest changes in your life um once you get to that point the rest of the time it's about learning skills and tools to navigate the world so the first two and a half years is the most important time in a person's life Typical of the speculative nature of such observations was Tiedemann's erroneous conclusion after watching the infant suck more on a cloth tied around something sweet than on a nurse's finger that the sucking appeared to be not instinctive but acquired. 
Um, so yeah, misconceptions there. Um, he didn't learn that. Your, your child learns to suck instinctively after he's born because he's hungry and he wants to nurse. So, <laughs> you know, back then there were some conclusions that were a bit erroneous. Um, but they laid the foundation for learning, you know, human development. Um, and like I said, we'll get into more of it um, so you can uh, learn why you do what you do. And this is all for now. Until next time.